Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to, good to be with you all today, and uh, I want to begin my sermon uh, by going back in time a little bit uh, to, you know, I'm kind of looking at those of you here gathered, so just a little background. These are two old uh, uh, singer-songwriters I want to talk about. Uh, it was, um, it happened in a Florida steakhouse. It was a smoke-filled room, and there were a couple of mob guys there uh, at the table along with these two old, so you won't know them, uh, Paul Anka and Frank Sinatra. And, uh, and they're telling lies and stories, as you can imagine, kind of a gathering like that around the table. And Frank says, in the midst of this, Frank says, I'm quitting the business. I'm sick of it. I'm getting out. There might have been an explanation in there, but I won't use that. But he says, I'm getting out. And that stays with Anka. And uh, back in New York at about 1 o'clock in the morning, Anka has an idea. He sits down with an old IBM electric typewriter. And based on his conversation, he began to write a song for Frank. He, he knew an old melody. He altered it, uh, thinking to himself, if Frank were writing this song, what would he say? And he began to type out, and now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. I did it my way. Anka said, we are, after all, the me generation. And Frank became the guy for me to say it. I ate it up and I spit it out. He finished the song about five in the morning waited a little bit, probably had a cup of coffee, and then called Frank, who was in Nevada uh, at Caesar's Palace, and said, I have something very special for you. To this day, uh, Anka's agents are angry that he gave the song to Frank, but that's another story. This Sunday, we shift from John's Easter message, which you had last Sunday, to Luke's resurrection narrative Luke is talking about eyes being opened and how they recognize the risen Christ. They, they have a, the passage itself flows right from another passage. You should probably be familiar, the road to Emmaus, where Jesus appears with a few people walking down the road, breaks bread, opens the scriptures, and they know who he is, right? So we're kind of following along this pattern of people not recognizing Jesus and then having this moment of, uh, of eyes being opened. So the, so the notion here, I would argue, is a particular meaning of knowing the essence uh, and being of Christ. It is, it is a conversion moment where the ideas of who he was are now changed by who he is. We have a few thoughts for you. I have a few thoughts and invite you to, to think about them, to digest them, and maybe this will be a help in renewing your own walk uh, with Jesus in this Easter season. First, there is in this passage a sense of movement, right? So we have uh, a startling uh, moment when Jesus appears, and they struggle with disbelief. That might be a little strong, but they certainly are confused about who this is and what's going on. But they move, right? So you have confusion, if you will. They move to revelation, right? So they move to a moment where they recognize Christ. Applied to us, we might say there is and would be for us some new clarity about the life that you and I have lived, of the things that we have experienced, and how the revealing of Christ's relationship in the past and in the present might change our view of the world. Now, another part of our passage is what the New Testament theologian Luke Timothy Johnson calls cognitive dissonance. 
there is something in the scripture, in the gospel, I, I would argue this is true all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, or we might look at the woman at the well in a gospel story, even consider Paul. There is something about this uh, gospel that turns the expectation of how it's supposed to be, how the world is supposed to be upside down. So there is a revelation of who the risen Christ is, and that revelation moves us to conversion, a uh, metanoia, a turning. The resurrection reveals to us in that moment, not just, oh, this is Jesus, but there is an understanding about the cross, that God's action on the cross intervenes in our powerlessness against sin. God frees us from the cross, from death and from our past defiant lives through forgiveness. It reveals the meaning of the ancient scriptures, that God actually is interested in the world in freeing people and taking care of the poor, the homeless, the helpless, that God is interested in these people, that God wants a different kind of community to bubble up in the middle of the world, that people may see that community and be changed just by seeing the actions of this community in the world. It reveals something, I think, about how we're to live. It invites us as a Christian community to live differently, both as individuals, but also as a whole. God invites us, if you will, to be an example of a different kind of family in the world. Luke Timothy Johnson says again, the opening of our eyes to see God's narrative truly is a, a opening to see Jesus both as part of a, a, a complex process of movement in our own lives, but also to provide meaning beyond our own lives. Now, I have to tell you, as a bishop, as your shepherd, I'm concerned that the pandemic and politics, maybe even our own upbringing, our own ideas about how the world should be, even our own past experience with the church, the understanding of ourselves, even if you're not a churchgoer, our experience in the world, the work and the people that we live with, all of this has contributed, I think, to a very troubling relationship with Jesus Christ. Too often, I think, we seek a gospel to affirm our lives, to affirm our strong-willed mismanagement of our lives, the mistreatment of others, rather than seeking a gospel that actually contradicts that kind of behavior in life and invites us beyond our own individual political tribalism. A revelation of Christ that invites us to see our lives and the lives of our community in stark contrast to the world around us. That at least in this place, we are unified beyond difference to be one family of God. In the Gospel of Luke, the resurrection has a hopeful expectation of conversion. Conversion of those things we humans hold dear. Most of all, our perspective, our political loyalties, whatever they are, our need to get things our way. I think sometimes we get stuck on our path with Jesus because we want to do it my way. The gospel has special news, just like Inca to, to Frank. The gospel special news is not an affirming message of how you did it your way. The gospel's message is one that celebrates how you actually give up doing it your way and take on the way of Christ. Anka had it right, but he also had it really wrong. The answer from Luke is that in order for us to be transformed, we have to hear God's story afresh and then open our eyes and be curious about the invitation to live differently in this world. You might take up the lens of, that St. Augustine used, for instance, to see that if you're reading the scripture 
And that if it isn't drawing you closer to God, and if it isn't drawing you closer to other people who are different than you, you're probably not reading it right. And if you're really curious about how serious Jesus is about this, just make a list of all the people Jesus goes to, all the people Jesus is willing to talk to, all the people that Jesus is willing to sit and have a meal with. They're all different. And most of them don't have anything to do with his own tribe as the Jews. It is a mission of diversity that brings all people together under, as we used to say in the old church, the flag of Christ. See who Jesus is and ask, are those people present in your life? Are they present in your church? And how might you reach out, get to know them? This is not about doing it my way or your way. But it is about discerning through the scripture what it means to do it God's way. With the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to send us out. And if you have any doubt about this, listen closely to the baptismal service that we are now ready to begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.